This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 5 on Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 28. The public ministry continues. Hello, good to be with you again. So we've been working through uh, Mark chapter 2, and we've been uh, working through the the public ministry uh, of of Jesus. And one of the things that we looked at last time, uh, beginning with the very end with the the leper, the man with leprosy, and and we looked at the relationship between leprosy and purity and purity language, and, and Jesus is the stronger his purity is stronger than the leper's impurity and, and then we look at the paralyzed man and how Jesus used that opportunity uh, with the man who is paralyzed to affirm their faith the the muscular display of their faith their active uh, uh, commitment to getting to Jesus use that as an opportunity to declare his power to forgive sins and how he linked his power to forgive sins with his ability to fully restore the paralyzed man. And of course, in the middle of that was a statement about Jesus' authority, about Jesus' ability to perceive the thoughts. And that, and that began to introduce uh, a growing conflict that was starting to bubble up now between the religious leaders and Jesus. What was hinted at before uh, now starts that division, starts to become more and more pronounced as they are asking who can do this but God alone. What is this man saying? He is, he is blaspheming. Uh, and then, and then that uh, that tension fed into the calling of Levi, where uh, Jesus calls one who would have been considered a very a despicable person, deplorable, a sinner by definition, because of the extortion that he would have uh, used his um, that he would have done, given his ability as a tax collector and his position. How uh, one such as this uh, was still uh, called? Uh, there was no pre-qualification, if you will, for Jesus' call. It is completely Jesus' decision, and he, he says, follow me, and he immediately follows. And then there was a party, and he's eating with tax collectors, and what I, what I argued would have been people from other sinful vocations, prostitution, uh, perhaps um, um, you know, strong men who had been used as uh, the ruffians of sorts to do um, physical harm and, and, and others. And there's a controversy uh, uh, that happens there. Again, the religious leaders asking the disciples, why is it that Jesus is committing a, uh, a, a social uh, error uh, and even one that would have affected his honor and his shame by associating with those who are by definition sinners to which Jesus replies that this is the exact group from whom he has come. And so with that in mind, I want us to keep thinking about this this growing controversies that that are occurring and we see this stacking one upon each other uh, in Mark. Mark will often present controversies right uh, right in a row and so there's a way that what's happened previously is informing uh, what is what is occurring. So I want to look at a controversy that happens regarding the question of fasting uh, here in chapter 2 continuing our work looking at verses 18 through 22. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of untrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst to skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. So there's, there seems to be a, a combination of some material here that's been uh, condensed, verses 18 through 20, and then verses 21 through 22, this question of fasting, and then these, these statements about cloth and wine. And when we look at it, um, this, there's a biographical focus as well, which I find interesting in verses 18 through 20, what it tells us about Jesus, about how he's the focus of the celebration as one 
who brought something new to the scene that made fasting wrong. So let's think about this fasting again, trying to set the context. Likely is referring to regular fasting, uh, fasting that might have occurred like on Mondays and Thursdays perhaps, more than the annual fast day uh, associated with festivals like the Day of Atonement or Rosh Hashanah. The implication, of course, is that there's this established um, ritual of fasting that would occur regularly, of which the, the, the followers of John, which referring to John the Baptist, are doing, and the Pharisees are doing. So here, would, uh, presumably, the way the logic works is here's two very respected groups, those who have been following John and the Pharisees, uh, and, and these groups are continually to practice these regular fasting, but the disciples of Jesus are not. And in the question, um, uh, you know, but yours are not, I think is interesting is, is, is what is the tone of the question? And what, when we look at the tone of the question, if I was to say that, uh, or rather if Mark was to say, some religious leaders from Jerusalem came and asked Jesus, this question, we would immediately know the tone is that the religious leaders are uh, having uh, issue with this and this may be a way of trapping. The fact that uh, Mark uh, tells us that just some people came and asked Jesus may indicate that there might actually be some earnest questioning happening here, not simply um, controversy surrounding trying to trap or trip Jesus. That being said, the, the, the nature of the question might allow, and the mention of the Pharisees might allow for a bit of blending of both. I just find it interesting, I think as you walk through narrative, we must always ask the question of who is doing what and where, and how does that help us understand what is going on. Now, Jesus' answer uh, is, is interesting because the implication is the teacher is responsible for the behavior of the disciples. The question isn't getting at the heart of, um, are the disciples doing wrong, but why is it that you do not make sure your disciples are fasting? So really the question is about uh, why Jesus is not having them fast. And he answers by, by presenting a, a picture here, um, you know, where he says, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he was with them? Now, this translation, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast, might, uh, I, I think, unplay, downplays it a little bit. Uh, the, it's really the sons of the bridegroom is sort of the idea that's presented in the language, or the sons of the bridal chamber. So it isn't just the guests, but it's a, those who are the close group who um, have, have responsibilities of, of, of enjoying and celebrating with the bridegroom, they would stand guard at the bridal chamber. That was one of their jobs, uh, protecting it, uh, guaranteeing, uh, being able to uh, announce the, the consummation of, of the marriage. Uh, so this, these aren't just people who are invited to come sit and go enjoy some cake. Like These are uh, individuals who have a, a special relationship with the groom. And... and the, the, the question is, how can the, the guests of the bridegroom fast while he was with them so long they, they cannot, so long as they have him with them? And, and the idea here is, it, is Jesus is painting a scene of what is currently occurring with the disciples and him, that it's akin to a bridal celebration. It's akin to a moment of joy where the bridegroom and the, uh, the sons of the bridegroom, the, metaphorically speaking, the, the attendants of the bridegroom, are together. And at a wedding, you wouldn't think of fasting at a wedding. To fast at a wedding celebration like this would be completely inconsistent with the moment. And, and the moment is one of joy and one of celebration. Uh, the, you know, fasting has this idea uh, of, of, of purposefully um, keeping food from yourself for a reason, whether it is, it is uh, to uh, the, the suffering of the fast that helps sort of contemplate in a devotional act or the, the, a symbolic refusal of something to, uh, you know, to set a, an atmosphere of devotion. There were different reasons that were given for fasting. There were usually seasons that were set apart related to some form of devotion or piety. But at the heart of fasting is a lack 
And to fast is to lack food, to suffer, to feel and lack. And what Jesus is saying is, is that makes no sense when one's around him. That there's the, the idea of, of, of suffering or of lacking uh, in the presence of Jesus is, in, is as inconsistent as the sons of the bridegroom fasting during the middle of a wedding celebration. And so I think this is fascinating because he's clearly presenting himself as the bridegroom. And, and it's possible right, that you see uh, uh, Old Testament references even at play in this view, whether it's Isaiah 54 or, six, or Isaiah 62 or Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, where God himself is depicted as a bridegroom. And there may be even implicitly here a complaint that Jesus is taking on this role previously predicated to God. And of course, the great wedding banquet feast idea of which uh, uh, at, the, at the end of all things, uh, there is a, a, a perpetual, continual, eternal banquet, uh, a wedding feast that is being celebrated. So all kinds of, of, of imagery comes into play. Uh, the analogy is that the bridegroom uh, the, the idea of the wedding, uh, fasting at a wedding, would be uh, shows the incongruity of the of the disciples also fasting in his presence. But he doesn't stop there, which I think is fascinating, and that, that might have been sufficient. To know. I mean, he has said that what uh, uh, the Pharisees are doing and what John's disciples are doing, uh, and to some extent, he's almost implying, yeah, that makes sense in their situation. But it doesn't make sense here because I'm here. I'm the thing that changes. Why are the disciples not fasting? Because they're with me. That something is different in my presence. Uh, a very, very strong statement. But then he, then he shifts from this picture, from this metaphor, and he goes into a, an idea of a wedding that would never happen. Like you, you get this, um, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they they will fast. Well, there isn't um, there isn't this picture of normal wedding practices where all of a sudden the bridegroom gets taken away, and the and then the the guests of the bridegroom all fast and, and go into to, to mourning. So he's he's changed something here in this story. There's a there's a bit of a a, a surprise and. And I find that um, interesting that maybe here you have, and I think here you do have, a, a foreshadowing that, that Jesus, while saying, you know, because I'm currently here is an occasion of joy akin to a wedding, there's going to be a moment where those here who are with me are not going to be experiencing joy, where they're going to be uh, experiencing heartache, and, and, and yearning, the, the, the very motivations of, of, of that are akin to the calling for a fast. And so the question becomes, wh- what is this time he's talking about? But the time will come. What is he referring to? And for me, the, the answer to that is the, the, uh, the taken from them phrase. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, I think the option of sort of the ascension doesn't work here um, because Jesus isn't uh, forcefully taken. And in fact, Scripture is quite clear that that is a, a, a moment to, uh, that, that is a good moment. Jesus gives commands as the Holy Spirit will come and, and, and the paraclete and will inform. So it seems unlikely that Jesus would want to connect his ascension after his resurrection to this. It seems more likely that I think he's referring to his coming arrest uh, and death, that there will be a time where he will be taken from them. Uh, and then the, the, those moments where he is taken, referring to the trial, the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, and the burial, that those moments will be qualitatively different, that those moments will be uh, the opposite, if you will, of the wedding feast. Um, but will be full of lack, and that there are there are these times that are coming for these particular disciples. I, I think that's what he's referring to. And so you have this this um, uh, metaphor, 
this idea that there's a new state of affairs, the bridegroom is present, there's a new state of affairs that's at work. And I think that's what uh, initiates into what happens in 21 and following. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece pulls away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine to old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. So I think we have this, this uh, he presents two pictures of how the old and the new cannot simply be mixed together. That something uh, profoundly different has occurred, just as his presence is profoundly different and has made the, the behavior of the disciples profoundly different. That this, this discussion of cloth and of wine uh, shows the potency of the new thing. That the new wine is so potent that the old cannot hold it. Or that the unshrunk cloth, um, the new piece will pull away from the old. It has a strength uh, and, and picture to it. And of course, these images would have been ones they readily understood. They readily understood that, of course, you would never do that between old and new cloth. And you never do new wine in old wineskins. And, and the idea here is, whereas the Pharisees might have assumed, the religious leaders might have assumed that to prepare for the Messianic age, prepare for the Messiah coming, that there would be, that, that would be uh, congruent with a strict adherence to their traditions. Uh, Jesus is saying the coming of God is very different and is much more potent and it's much stronger and it comes in my presence. And so there's this, um, this forceful rethinking of things that to try, to, and then he's challenging those who are asking this question, to try to think of what is happening in the presence of Jesus in the same terms as you've thought of everything else is to try to put new wine into old wineskins. To try to think of the arrival of Jesus in the same way as the oral traditions or the understanding of what was thought to occur with the coming of the Messiah is to try to put new cloth into old cloth. And so to think of the disciples needing to fast in the presence of Jesus would be to do the same. And so we get this, this controversy uh, uh, at work, this small little um, powerful statement. I want to move on to the next uh, controversy that occurs here with verse 23 through 28. And again, Note that there is this continual stacking of, of controversies. And notice how often it focuses around food. So many of the issues that come up in the Gospel of Mark deal with eating or somehow related to food. And I don't think that's an accident. One, so much of the, the oral tradition was around food and dealt with dining practices. But, but I find it um, uh, uh, interesting how these continue to have very similar themes. So let's pick this up here at the end of chapter 2 with verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So now we have eating and Sabbath kind of working together. And, and I think we should note that the controversy really is not over the gleaming and eating of a little grain. Uh, that, was, that was allowed. Uh, uh, that was allowed to the stranger and the poor by Deuteronomy 23. The issue is not then really the eating. But perhaps the issue is more that they could be accused of reaping. It's the 
reaping on the Sabbath. That there's a type of work that is prohibited in Exodus 34. Uh, and, and in the Mishnah, it's explicitly prohibited. And so we have this pattern that we're looking at. Verse 24, I mean, excuse me, with uh, verse uh, 27 having this maxim, which leads to a conclusion uh, in verse 28. And, and so we have this setting that leads to a maxim uh, and that leads to a conclusion from that maxim. So let's look at uh, uh, the, the, the process of how this plays out. First of all, notice that pattern. The Pharisees said, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? That interplay, asking the master why the followers are doing wrong, asking the followers why the master is doing wrong. This is a common uh, and not this is a common tactic and not an uncommon way of of beginning a a conflict. So at the heart here is not uh, Jesus. You need to correct your disciples. That's not what is happening here. The implication is Jesus. Why are you? providing such a teaching or such a way of thinking that your disciples are, uh, feel free to neglect the Sabbath, uh, especially in your presence. So we have this attack on the disciples, if you will, Sabbath behavior. But notice Jesus' response is, is, he, is he goes to um, defending his disciples by turning to Scripture. So Jesus is going to have a scriptural debate with these leaders. This is, uh, uh, gets in that category which we would expect with scribes and scribes' interpretations where they would be using bits of the Scriptures to help inform into specific situations because the assumption was there was a univocality in Scripture that uh, scripture said the same thing, uh, and so you could go to other parts of Scripture to affirm or interpret um, uh, disputed areas. And he goes by mentioning that David and his men were a, a time in Scripture when David and his men were hungry, and that their need allowed them to do a certain action, that their uh, need allowed them to take advantage of the um, uh, social security system, if you will, that's in Leviticus, that the poor and the hungry were allowed to pluck grain in other people's fields. And so even though they're talking about the Sabbath, Christ responds by affirming their right, by going to David and showing precedence to ignore a ritualistic practice if need warranted it. So that's the connection he is trying to make, that the ritualistic practice that David um, did was to ignore the, uh, the, the legal right of the priest to eat the consecrated bread, but no one else. So David allows his, his men uh, to enter into the house of God and eat bread that was set apart consecrated bread, ritualistic set apart bread. And of course, in 1 Samuel 21, we know David and his men are certainly in need. They're on the run from Saul. This is the moment. This is the story that he's referring to. And what, what David is, and how Jesus' argument works is it presumes that the Pharisees here uh, that, that, uh, that, he's, that he's speaking to, that the Pharisees would affirm what David did was right. I mean, the assumption here is that what David did was right. And that, well, if David was right to have his men eat bread because of need, they were on the run from Saul. If if they were right to eat because of need, to break ritual, that need was more important than, than observing the ritual. If David was right, then he says, so are my disciples. That the reaping requirement on the Sabbath... Um, does not demand they don't uh, that they surrender their need here, if you will, that their need to eat uh, is, is justified. This would be sort of a, a, a common way of illustrating a point, uh, you know, a, um, a, um, 
uh, a type of Jewish argumentation that the Pharisees would have been familiar with. Now, there is a bit of problem, maybe as a side note uh, to address, is the question of does Jesus know his Bible? Because verse 26 says, has Jesus saying, in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he, meaning David, entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread. Well, here's the problem. When, if, when we look at the, the, the Hebrew Bible, it wasn't Abiathar who was high priest at that time, but it was Ahimelech. Is there a mistake here? Uh, indeed, when you look at Matthew and Luke, Matthew 12 and Luke 6, and their, their accounts of it, they take the days of high priest Abiathar out. They remove it. Of course, it gets even more confusing when you add to the fact in the Old Testament that Abiathar and Ahimelech also appeared to be confused, or at least it's confusing. If you look at 1 Samuel 22, 20, 2 Samuel 8, 17, 1 Chronicles 18, 16, 1 Chronicles 24, 6, you, you know, and, and even the, the, the genealogies, it seems to be there's a little bit of interplay. What do we sort of make of that? As should, did Jesus get the wrong guy? when he says in the days of Abiathar. Well, I think, I think the important aspect here is to recognize we, we do not want to import a modern way of speaking into the ancient context. It was not uncommon to speak of the, a time period or the days of or the, and use the most dominant figure as the one to characterize that, that time period. So Abiathar was the more dominant high priest during, the, during uh, David's span, uh, not Ahimelech. So to call it in the days of Abiathar, it would not have been an incorrect statement. Where we would think of it in terms of, well, that's not accurate, but we're looking at it from a different way of conveying information. Jesus is not disputing whether Ahimelech or was the high priest there or not, he's characterizing the time. And you would characterize the time frequently by the most dominant figure. It would be akin, uh, you know, perhaps uh, to say, uh, uh, during the Revolutionary War period of the United States of America, in the days of George Washington. And not necessarily have to be referring to, you could be referring to something that occurred during the presidency of John Adams, and still refer to it in the days of George Washington as a characterization of that period. It would be akin to something like that. Uh, in, in case you're interested, like this would have been the show bread, right? That's in view here. Uh, that bre- the bread that is baked just before Sabbath. Twelve loaves are, are, are baked for the priest. Now, I love that he goes to David here. And going to David here also allows a, a messianic echo to be in place that he is using an example of David doing right and the followers of David uh, as a justification for what he did uh, and what he allowed his, his followers to do. And this leads then, of course, to the statement, uh, um, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Incidentally, we have something very simple, similar from a 2nd century rabbi, 2nd uh, century A.D. rabbi, uh, written uh, and commenting on Exodus. Uh, the Sabbath has been given to you, you, not ha- you have not been given to the Sabbath. And it, it could be a possibility that we have there from the 2nd century um, uh, a rabbi picking up on a statement known that Jesus had made uh, and that had gotten legs, or that there maybe was a tradition that had this sort of statement uh, idea. But even more important, remember in Capernaum, when Jesus was teaching, the comments were made that he has a teaching with an authority unlike the scribes. I think this is a great example of it. Of, we asked the question when we were looking that, at that chapter 1, what does it mean to have an authority teaching authority that's unlike the scribes. Well, this first bit of this interaction, which is clearly a debate. I mean, when Jesus introduced it in verse 25 with, have you never read? 
I mean, to say, have you never read to the Pharisees is, a, is an insult, uh, is, is indicating we're going to have a debate where my goal is to prove your ignorance. I mean, that was, that was not a kind way of introducing a polite discussion. So this is clearly a scribal discussion. And Jesus follows a very um, 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 uh, 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 Haggadic uh, way of arguing. He follows a very standard way of arguing, which is I'm going to find a different example from Scripture that proves the principle, namely, need warrants overcoming uh, uh, legal uh, precept and, and let it apply here. So everything he's doing up to that point is extremely in keeping with an authority like the scribes. But it's the next statement that I think starts getting into the authority unlike the scribes, where he declares the intent of the Sabbath, that the Sabbath was made, uh, uh, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, that he is taking a position of declaring, I know the purpose of the Sabbath. This has moved beyond. The, the debate here then has moved beyond, did they do right in this, in this gleaning of the grains? Did they do right? It's moved beyond that. Had that been his only goal, which was to justify the behavior and saying that this is in keeping with uh, uh, scripture, he would have accomplished that goal. But he goes one step further and, and begins to declare the intent of why Sabbath exists to begin with. This is a divine perspective to be able to declare the intent of the Sabbath. No longer is it in keeping with the Sabbath, it's why the Sabbath. And the, the, the position that, that Christ takes is the Sabbath was to serve, was a gift to serve humanity. The Sabbath was put in place so that humanity could rest, so that those could, they could enjoy and set apart a, a, a time to, to, to worship and to recover and to recoup. It was a gift from God to uh, humanity, and, and indeed, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the time uh, of, of the age to come is, is often frequently depicted as enjoying Sabbath, as a time of perpetual rest and enjoyment from, from the hard work. So Sabbath was, was supposed to be of service. And so, thus, if, if Sabbath was supposed to be of service, if, if a man was in need, if a woman was in need on the Sabbath, well, the, the design of the heart of the Sabbath was God wants their needs met. God wants them to be taken care of. The Sabbath was a means of care. It was an artificial time that God inserted. There's nothing natural about the timing of the week. There is something natural about the timing of the day, right? If you think about uh, the sun rising and setting, or even the year with the rotation of the planet around the sun, but the arbitrary week, you know, that is a sort of as a God-inserted time of which part of that was set apart the Sabbath. And what these religious leaders have done, if they've turned the Sabbath from a gift into a burden, they've, they've uh, instead of the needs of people being met, of which the Sabbath was designed for, what has occurred is actually people are suffering or, or are potentially allowed to suffer if it somehow violated the Sabbath. So it's been a flip. The, the, the stipulations of the oral tradition that has surrounded the Sabbath, they've turned the Sabbath into something that it was not. And his justification for being able to say that, he further goes on to say is, so... Um, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now we know what the Son of Man, which is an interesting title. The Son of Man uh, is, is, is the Christological title that Jesus most often takes for himself, yet is rarely put upon Jesus from others. Usually Jesus will be declared to be Lord or Messiah, um, Son of God. Uh, but Son of Man he takes upon himself. And Son of Man can have a variety of 
of meanings. Uh, one is it can be simply another way of speaking about, another way of saying human, man. Um, who is like the son of man that you consider him? You know, there's this idea of just the, the mortality. Another is a possible circumlocution for I. Uh, uh, so it's not Christological at all, not title at all. It's just another way of saying I. So instead of saying I am, am speaking about the Gospel of Mark, I would say the Son of Man is speaking about the Gospel of Mark. Is another way of saying that. The third, though, is a Christological title that uh, we, we, we seems to have its root most most likely in Daniel seven. In Daniel seven, and you have the apocalyptic visions that are at work, the different beasts that are waging. Uh, war and battle upon uh, the chosen, uh, upon the elect. And, and into these beasts, Daniel has this vision of a, of a, of a final figure who's uh, described as one like the Son of Man. And this one like the Son of Man uh, sits uh, in the company of God, and if you, as you read through Daniel 7, represents also the people and is victorious. And, and this one like the Son of Man, and, and there's all kinds of interesting creation imagery because the, the kingdoms that are at war and the symbolism associated with those kingdoms that we don't have time to get into now, but they're all beasts, but the one who subdues them is, uh, it looks like human, you know, and you have Genesis picture, Garden of Eden picture, beasts, yet it is man who is uh, dominant over, over the beasts. And so there's and all, all types of of imagery available. Well, this, this one like the Son of Man who then sits in judgment, sits in the company of the Most High, uh, and, and, and represents the people, uh, develops, uh, after Daniel, uh, develops into this figure idea to where, uh, and you see this in some of the other Second Temple literature that's around the time of Jesus, where there is this uh, desire for this Son of Man, this figure who... Uh, uh, Daniel uh, depicted in a vision now becomes a distinct expected figure who will come. Uh, and so it's a very high figure. I mean, the irony is we sometimes think of Son of Man as a low figure when it comes to the depiction of Christ, but it's actually a very high Christological title. If it's f- coming from Daniel 7, it's a high Christological title. And, and we'll see uh, often Jesus uses Son of Man uh, in references to authority and, and, and to power. And, and when, when he talks about the Son of Man must suffer, that's, people have a big problem. The followers of Jesus have a big problem with that because how could this figure, Son of Man, suffer? Those two seem to be against each other. The, um, uh, when, the, when the religious leaders when the high priests will ask Jesus if he is the Christ, Jesus will affirm it, and then they, he says, and you will see the Son of Man you know, coming in the clouds. And that's when they rip their clothes for blasphemy because he's gone from uh, a, uh, not only affirming he's the Messiah, but even one step more to uh, declaring he's the Son of Man who will come and judge. So this Son of Man figure, this is the title Jesus seems to take upon himself that he wants. And I think that's what's at here. I don't think, verse 28, a similar argue that Son of Man here is another way of saying man. I mean, the idea being there that, it, that Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And that doesn't make a lot of sense here because Jesus is making an authoritative statement. I think he's saying, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Not, uh, not, un, not different to what we already saw in chapter 2, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins when, when this was the healing of the paralytic. There is clearly Jesus. Jesus wasn't declaring so that you may know all people have the authority to forgive sins. He's clearly talking about himself. And he even goes on to say, which is easier to say, forgive sins or get up your, take up your mat and walk. So I think with that in mind, we look at verse 28, and Jesus is giving the reason for why he can say the intent of the Sabbath. The reason he can say why the, the intent of the Sabbath is because he is the Son of Man. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, meaning he gave the Sabbath and knows the reason for it. It becomes a much stronger statement. This is what we've been 
uh, looking at uh, in chapter 2. Uh, this, these ideas of the, the various uh, authoritative uh, relationships that are in view. Notice the way it's been playing out, though. We went from, uh, uh, in Capernaum, uh, this idea of Jesus being able to teach with an authority that they haven't seen before, to cast out miracles with authority, to exercise demons with an authority. We, we move from that and even through the story of the leper, but when we get into the paralyzed man and we get into the controversy of the picking grain on the Sabbath, Jesus' authority is becoming more and more pronounced. He's starting now to make clear his authority isn't simply the stronger one, as John the Baptist called him, but the stronger one because of divine identity. He isn't just the uh, expected Messiah that's come, but there's something more. He has come with the power to forgive sins, meaning he, the, to undo the, the fall. Something the religious establishment, that was their right to do, was to declare something clean or unclean. Jesus tells the leper he's clean. It was their authority to do the sacrifices in accordance with uh, what Scripture said. Jesus is saying, I can declare sins are forgiven. Two, uh, it, was, it was their authority to say what was uh, right or wrong on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, I know why the Sabbath exists, for I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He's, he's issuing statements that are going to inevitably lead to further and further conflict. Because he's establishing his authority on the plane of God, not on the plane of humanity. We're going to see this uh, continue to play in. We're going to see Sabbath controversies continue to show up. We're going to see food controversies. And we're going to get uh, to a, uh, in in chapter 3, to a conflict with the religious leaders uh, regarding the sheer number of exorcisms to where the dividing lines now are clearly set. Look forward to going through chapter 3 with you next time when we meet. Thank you. This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 5 on Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 28. The public ministry continues. Mm -hmm. 